Welcome to episode 39 of Oscar Sunday. I'm Austin Johnson. I'm Connor Izagari. And today we will be discussing in the career of John Cassavetes, mainly 1968's Faces, which got three nominations at the 41st Academy Awards. It didn't win anything, but uh, we've got some awards to give out to it. And uh, I want to get some general thoughts on the film uh, just to get us started. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> Take it away, buddy. <laughs> All right, so we've covered a lot on this show, 41 episodes in. Yes. They're not 41. 30, 30, 39, 39. 39. My mistake, thinking ahead. We, and, we are uh, just, we are, well, we're doing the 41st Academy Awards, and you and I are just talking about what we're going to yeah. do for episode 41. <laughs> yep, I was brainwashed momentarily. So <laughs> we've covered a lot, and we've covered mostly some really amazing films. The lowest we've really gotten so far, in our opinion, is uh, Olivier's Hamlet. And that's only because it hasn't particularly aged well, and it's hard to adapt Shakespeare. Uh, this ranks significantly lower to me. <laughs> so I did not enjoy Faces. Uh, I found it pretentious, confusing, and really kind of pointless. Uh, I just don't get it. I don't know why there's such value in watching angry, like rich white people just randomly scream at their significant others for over two hours. I, I don't get, I think Cassavetes had some serious like emotional problems that he threw into his movies with his wife. <laughs> so yeah, I just, I found nothing to take away from this movie and I was, I was not a fan. Yeah. 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 Uh, you, your, your review is up on filmgasm.com and yeah. You gave it a whopping five. And of course, I, I pretty much read every review you do. Uh, I like reading them. I think you're a good writer. And I always just like to see what you think about movies. Um, Thank you. Because usually usually I'm going to watch them or I have seen it before. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <clears throat> this is definitely the biggest like gap that we've had on the show by by a mile. Yeah. Uh, like you said, with uh, with Hamlet from 1948, we just we didn't really dig that one too much, especially the other four movies that we watched uh, that were up for Best Picture. We just we liked those a lot more. Yeah, um, it's a really cool year, and we just felt like Hamlet was kind of kind of a weak one to to take the to take the Best Picture award. But uh, with this one, it's totally different. You know, we're going into a territory where it's yeah, just got three nominations. Uh, two, two for supporting roles and then uh, for best screenplay for Mr. Cassavetes. And it's, <clears throat> it's one of those that I'd heard about that it's, it's definitely like an acquired taste. It's this movie that's seen as it's ahead of its time as far as the, the style of it, the way, it, the way it's directed, the way it moves. And uh, it's shot on the, you know, the 16 millimeter black and white and it looks, it looks pretty cool uh, as far as style goes. When it comes to plot and story like you're talking about, I totally understand it's not <clears throat> really offering <laughs> really offering anything enlightening or uh, useful <laughs> <laughs> but 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 I, I, I was very, very entertained by it. Uh, right away about about five, ten minutes into the movie I, I turned to Brianna, my girlfriend, and I was like, I love watching drunk people argue <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I knew I was just in. And for, for a ride, because uh, as you know, Connor, I've kind of fallen in love with Cassavetes as an artist over the past year or so. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, starting with, you know, uh, Elaine May's Mikey and Nikki, uh, where he's acting alongside Peter Falk, and it's just an awesome, awesome 70s movie. Uh, and then, you know, A Woman Under the Influence that he directed, <clears throat> 1974, uh, Gloria, 1980. Um, you can add faces to the list. Uh, the Killers. He's 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 a, does an awesome performance in that movie. Uh, of course, Rosemary's Baby. I think he's wonderful as as Guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's going on and on now, and, and I I want to keep building it. I, I really like what this guy gave Dirty Dozen. <laughs> I really like what this guy gave um, to to cinema. You know and to American cinema and the way he kind of went against what was popular and by doing that made what he was doing popular in his own way, got, you know, got his own audience. And I, I, I'm definitely in the audience, you know, I'm kind of a sucker for his style. I'll, I'll say that uh, 
what all have you seen so far of, of Cassavetti's work? Um, as an actor, I've seen The Dirty Dozen and Rosemary's Baby. As a director, I've seen Faces and A Woman Under the Influence. Yeah, so those two, Faces and A Woman Under the a woman under the influence are both, you know, two hours plus and, you know, yeah, dialogue heavy, tons of talking, tons of arguing, tons of this and that. I wish, you know, <laughs> I wish I could convince you to keep going and, you know, watch something like Gloria from 1980. It's just got like a different, totally different pace, really cool New York city movie. But I understand, man, I understand when it's like you, you kind of, you put, you put your arm out there and you're like, Hey, I'm going to check out your stuff. And you, it kind of, you kind of get bit twice. I, I get it. I understand. It's, it's tough to, you know, justify my reasoning here. I'm just, you know, I'm, I've talked very much on all of these podcasts about how I appreciate a narrative, how much yes. I very much could like enjoy getting invested into a story and films like this that are just made for the sake of being made like they're trying they're experimenting in a way that like nobody's really asking for yeah and i don't understand how people can just veg out and get sucked into a movie that essentially builds up to nothing there's no like why should i care about these people why do i want to hear them scream at each other i just i don't find it i don't see it and i want to find it. i want to see it i wish i didn't have this block but i do and it's impossible to overcome. Once I hit that block, I'm staying there. <laughs> it's, you know. Mm. No, I, no, man, I understand. I, I love that we finally hit this episode where <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a key difference. I, I texted you earlier that it's, we're in Midsommar territory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I, I gave that movie, I believe, an eight, and you gave it a five or something. Yeah, and it was, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're... <laughs> we're in very similar territory here. Uh, and it's, it's fundamental differences in, in our, um, our, our kind of taste for how we spend time watching movies. Yeah. And I, I love that. I love that those differences are there because there's also times where we obviously totally agree and love movies and equally love movies and something like Fargo last week where we can just, you said veg out, talk about a movie. You can just veg out and just talk about forever, you know, and we had a blast both, both kind of validating that movie as just being really good, but it's also good uh, as movie fans. And as you know, we're on this, you know, on this show together, I think it's good to have these differences as well and kind of figure out what it is exactly. And you've, you've already nailed it a few times is uh, with, with faces, faces specifically is, what is the point exactly? You know, it's it for me, it's just to be entertained. And, you know, we, we did a whole big episode on over on a film gasm over twin peaks. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, for episode a hundred. And that was like <clears throat> big deal for both of us. Cause you got to unload a lot of your like frustrations and I got to just be like, ah, I, I, I adore them stringing me along for, you know, hours. And that's, that's, that's just part of like both of who we are. You, yeah. you are a writer, you are a narrative driven person. And I'm, I'm very much a sucker for just being kind of distracted, being kind of just kind of pulled into weird directions. And that's, that's something I like willingly sign up for, you know, and Cassavetes is a guy that I know I'm getting into, you know, an interesting place here when, you know, I'm watching his movies it's kind of its own experience, you know, it's not, it's not just another 1968 movie or something, you know, it's, it's, it's really what the hell, there's nothing else like it from that year uh, in, in American movie making. And I, I totally understand why <clears throat> there's a whole, you know, group of people that love it and group of people that are just kind of like, no, it's not for me. I get it. I think it's one of those movies that I, it, I totally understand. I think we've also covered movies that are, kind of for everybody <clears throat> you know they're kind of stories for everybody yeah and uh i think we can both kind of see that well you know this is the late 60s things are changing this is yeah you know, oh yeah drastic an, an era especially in film of experimentation and 
trying out new things that have never really been done in film before. And one of the things I admire about you is that you can appreciate that style and somebody's attempt to do something different. And I, you know, I just, I want that. I can see that sometimes I, it's just very rare for me that style wins over substance. And this was not one of those times, but I see what Cassavetes is trying to pull off here. Yeah. And yeah. I can see why people would be in love with this movie, in love with all of his work, because he definitely has a way of expressing love that very few other directors have. Yeah. Uh, I just, yeah. yeah, just didn't jive with me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, just to speak on Woman on the Influence a little bit, like, remember, I think I mentioned, because we talked about it in the Chinatown episode, because that's when I, first watched it talk, just talking 1974 and it's like kind of like marriage story on crack yeah <laughs> yes you know and and you know i think i think that's what you said about cassavetti is that he's obviously knows what he's going for and that's that's the thing is like that he there's there's clearly like an ego there but it's like a it's like a kind of kind of a an addicting ego it's a cool ego to i'm i'm glad it i'm glad the ego's in that guy and not somebody <laughs> and not somebody else cuz i'm glad he's putting it forth and just spending his own money on movies and getting shit done the way he wanted to and kind of tr- trying to ride the wave you know you you spoke on the you know the late 60s ride this wave of of change and embrace it and kind of be on the front the forefront of it yeah. I, I adore people like that. You got, you know, another guy that comes to mind is like Mike Nichols, you know, the graduate just fucking cool as shit. And I think that, I think that marries the style and substance, you know, gets married in that one. I think that's why it, it stands so, so strong. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of movies in that, that era that will, we will always bring up uh, when we're talking about late sixties, you know, we've, we've, we've done a few now, you know, we, we talked about Z we talked about even uh, even 1970. We talked about five easy pieces. You know, we've we've kind of been around. We talked about in the heat of the night. We've been here before. You know, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's it's a it's a fun era. It's a fun era. And like you said, it's a lot of a lot of experimenting. And Cassavetes is one of those one of those guys you just kind of got to at least give a go. Well, I also love when actors become directors because those are either you know it's either people just want to sit behind the camera or it's people who have a vision and let it be known. And Cassavetes is definitely one of those guys. Uh, maybe I do, you know, maybe I just got off on the wrong foot. Maybe I do need to continue to pursue and I'll find something. That's the best way to look at these guys is, you know, I didn't really like, you know, Kubrick the first couple of times I saw his movies. I was like, these are kind of shit, but I kept going. I'm like, Oh, here it is. I see it now. So maybe it does take, you know, a little bit more than two steps into the woods. Maybe I need to get on the path, take that hike. Take, take that hike. You took the hike. You took the hike with David Lynch and you found a couple that you really liked. Yeah. It was a weird ass hike. Tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Cassavetes hike is real up and close. <laughs> yeah. The Lynch hike is like through dimensions. The Cassavetes hike is like there, but he's like punching you in the back of the head the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love it. I love it. You got uh, Peter Falk just in your ear screaming at you. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's fantastic! <laughs> oh man, John, John Cassavetes. Uh, unfortunately, you know, didn't wasn't wasn't around for for too too long. He died at age fifty nine, mm. <clears throat> but he, you know, was a uh, decorated as far as Oscars go. And this is Oscar Sunday, so I do want to bring up properly uh, the the three nominations that he has uh, as an individual, and that would be f- for acting. He was nominated for Best Actor in a Supporting Role, Dirty Dozen. Uh, and then for Screenplay, 1968, Faces, he was nominated. Uh, and then he was nominated for Best Director, A Woman Under the Influence, 1974. That's, that's pretty pretty cool, huh? To be able to go one, two, three, do, do, <laughs> do all three things. Uh, it's, that's you're in rare territory. Yeah, that doesn't happen often. And I'm also glad I've seen all three of those films. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah, man. You know, I think... You know, and you sprinkle in Rosemary's Babies right there in the late 60s as well, you know, and you just keep, like you said, you keep giving it a go. I, I also think Mikey and Nikki, for you, 
as far as performances, I, I know you're going to like that one. That's, that's a Elaine May. That's, well, that's an awesome film. Uh, him and Peter Falk just, yeah, just, you know, having a night. <laughs> one thing I will say, a woman under the influence really gave me a new appreciation for Peter Falk is I thought he was just, you know, Columbo and the grandpa from princess bride. He was a whole different person and yeah, he's got a whole bunch of performances I've never even heard of. And now I want to go into this, you know, sixties and seventies and find a Peter Falk that, I never, you know, really knew about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. That's, that's one of the best things about this show is discovering performers like that. Or, you know, a guy that we're going to definitely be talking about is uh, Seymour Castle. Like this is his, you know, he has one nomination ever and this is, it's in this movie and the dude, the dude's just kind of sprinkled in random comedies throughout the two thousands and rest in peace. Uh, just awesome, awesome career. And to see him at this age, just kind of tearing it up was really cool. Yeah, he was, I didn't really get it with him getting the nomination. I thought, Oh, I loved his performance. Yeah. I, I would have, I would have sprinkled it somewhere else. I thought, fair he enough. Was, I thought he was great, but yeah, fair enough. Yeah. For a film I didn't really enjoy. I got to say the first half is, is better than the second half in my opinion. But you know, fair enough. I like that. I, yeah, I, I like that. I think you can definitely kind of make it into, you know, different segments. Uh, talked a lot about Cassavetes. Uh, there are people in here that have been nominated just one time or two times. So let's start with, uh, start with John Marley, who's, you know, the lead performer in this movie in Faces. Uh, and he's been nominated one time in his career. And that would be for Love Story, 1970s, nominated for Best Actor Supporting Role. I have not seen that. No, we deliberately skipped that when we did our Five Easy Pieces episode because the other nominate nominees are pretty shitty, and we didn't want to we didn't want to keep going. <laughs> yeah, and now I now shame on us, you know. <laughs> now I wish I wish I had a an opinion on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know. Here, here's a here's a star. Here's a here's a woman that's definitely involved in Cassavetti's career. It'd be Jenna Rollins. Um, she's another another star in Faces and the star of A Woman Under the Influence uh, alongside Peter Falk. Uh, she's the star of Gloria. Sprinkled throughout Cassavetti's career, uh, they were married, and she has been nominated two times for A Woman Under the Influence and Gloria, yep. both for lead actress. Uh, she won an honorary award in 2016. Uh, she's just kind of, kind of a legend in her own way, you know, and really wish she would have got a win at some point. Yeah. Yeah. She was, um, I knew about her, uh, from the skeleton key. That was, uh, the movie I had, I had known about. Uh, it's, I haven't seen that in a long time, but I remembered her and that movie was super creepy. So, yeah, she's, I, I admire that she's, you know, just, I think she's retired now, but she really just kept going and just getting work. And uh, that's pretty cool. I admire that. Yeah, me too, man. Me too. I, she's someone I have a whole different respect after watching her and her younger days in her prime, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a, it, like, like similar to Peter Falk. It, when you, when you just simply watch stuff, when they were really giving it all, uh, giving it their, you know, best go. It changes everything for you. Yeah, for sure. And I do want to mention that um, I didn't realize, it, I, I recognized John Marley's voice, particularly his loud voice. And I couldn't really put my hand, my finger on it until I realized he's the guy who wakes up in The Godfather to find a horse head in his bed. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I recognized his scream. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Jack Waltz, you don't fuck with the mob. But uh, just yeah. a few years later. Yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. Good call. Good call. I like that, that you were like, oh, I know John Marley from something. I know that loud voice. <laughs> uh, that's fantastic. Seymour <laughs> uh, Castle brought up a little bit ago. Uh, him and uh, Lynn Carlin, both nominated one time, both for faces. Yeah. Uh, so you got you got a little bit going on here with the cast. You got a little bit going on with Cassavetes as the writer director. Uh, 
these are the kind of movies we like to dive into on, on Oscar Sunday, along with, you know, the heavy hitters like Chinatown, you know, just keep a good balance. And, and I, I, I like that we did. And I really want to look at the 41st Academy Awards. So you and I can, you and I can, you know, discuss a little bit of these, these categories and maybe, maybe talk a little bit about some movies that we want to see from this, uh, this ceremony. Sounds good. Sounds good. Where would you like to start? Well, I'd like to start with a uh, fucking Oliver absolutely dominated, <laughs> D- dominated, you know, and Oliver is the last musical to win before Chicago. So you have this over 30 year gap of musicals not winning. And it kind of shows that those were not in anymore, you know, and things were changing very much. And Chicago is kind of an outlier and uh, we'll definitely do it on this show one day. But uh, Oliver is a movie I'm not um, familiar with and (laughs) I'm not really too keen on keen on getting to uh, anytime soon. Yeah, I don't really need to see, you know, a 153 minute musical about Oliver Twist. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, thanks. Well, you know, it is a Best Picture winner, so we are going to have to at some point. One, One day, one day we'll do that. And, you know, we'll watch Romeo and Juliet, Rachel, Rachel, The Lion in Winter and Funny Girl. Oof. That does not sound like a fun week. No, but, compare, compared to the stuff that's happening in the late 60s, other stuff. Good Lord. Boring. Yeah, just one year later, like, we've got some incredible films. Like, But I do want to say The Lion in Winter has been on my list for quite some time. Uh, of course, yeah. You got really interesting stuff happening with The Lion in Winter and Funny Girl because of the Barbara Streisand and Catherine Hepburn dual win it's never happened you know it's the only time that's happened so i don't see it ever happening again either no oh god no you don't really see a lot of domination in the oscars anymore they like to spread the wealth uh but there might be another movie that just you know sweeps it i think the last one that swept it was return of the king like since then there hasn't really been a clean sweep decent flick (laughs) yeah pretty good pretty good (laughs) Uh, return of the king is is okay but i I prefer, you know, <laughs> I don't even know what I'm going to say. All three of those movies are genius. <laughs> I love them. I love Lord of the Rings. I think they're great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those are going to, you know, eventually be a very fun episode on this show if we ever decide to take that leap. Yeah, it'd be tough. It'd have to be because you, how do you do that? Because you, obviously, only one of them won, right? So you, you do a best picture showdown around the movies from 2003. Eh, probably more fun to talk about all three Lord of the Rings movies or something like that. Yeah, maybe, you know, probably, probably. I think that would be a little bit more entertaining. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But at this, let's, let's go back to the 41st. Uh, yeah. 41st. We can talk about the, uh, the actor categories here. Yeah. Let's start with uh, best supporting actress. We got, um, Estelle Parsons for Rachel Rachel, Kay Medford for Funny Girl, Sandra Locke for The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, Lynn Carlin for Faces, and the winner, Ruth Gordon for Rosemary's Baby. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't even heard of these actresses, except for Estelle Parsons. I know her. But Kay Medford and Sandra Locke, I've never heard of. Uh, I, I own Funny Girl. I've seen it. It's all right. It's all right. Uh, but I, you know, I don't know much about Kay Medford. I'm in the same boat as you. Ruth Gordon and Rosemary's Baby is a really cool win. Just it's a really first off, it's a really good performance, really creepy. But it, it's it's great to see, you know, uh, you know, purebred horror movies get get some get some gold. Yeah. Um, and she's she's you know attached to, of course. You know, Roman Polanski's Rosemary's Baby, one of the most, you know, kind of influential horror movies the past 60 years. So uh, big, big, big time win. And I really, really wish that movie was in the best picture group. Um, there, there are movies here that you could put together to make an awesome five. Yes. You yes. really could. You know, you, you got stuff here. Uh, of course, 2001 Space Odyssey, you know, is like this movie that's lived on to be kind of iconic. And I haven't seen it in so long that I want I want to get a new perspective on it. Uh, it's been it's been a while because I wasn't I, I think you and I are not as big of fans as that one as we are other Kubrick stuff. True. Very true. Yeah, I've, I find that film. 
kind of boring. I know I'm not really painting myself the best critical lens with this with this episode. But you like you like Rosemary's Baby. I love Rosemary's Baby. It's a great movie. <laughs> but yeah, 2001, not really a fan. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's uh, Lynn Carlin. Do you think she, you know, whatever, quote unquote, deserves this nomination? Yeah, yeah, she was good. She is good. She is she is pretty damn pretty damn good in this movie and. I, I like the I kind of like the whole cast. Well, you kind of do. If it works for you, you kind of have to like the whole cast and the kind of assholery that's going on. So, yeah, yeah, well said. Uh, <laughs> let's t- let's go over to best supporting actor. We've got uh, Gene Wilder for the producers, Jack Wilde for Oliver, Daniel Massey for Star, Seymour C- Castle for Faces, and the winner Jack Albertson for the subject was Roses. Mm. Um, I love that Gene Wilder was even considered and, uh, just out of, you know, loyalty, I would go for Gene Wilder for the producers. Cause that is a hilarious movie and a great performance. And, uh, I have not seen the rest of these films or know who they actors are. I know Jack Albertson, of course, but I have not seen those films. Yeah. I've like heard, kind of heard of these guys, but I, again, I don't have <clears throat> much to say about this. We, you know, typically don't focus too heavy on the ceremony as we do uh, what's going on within the movie, which is faces, of course, this week. Uh, but I, I got to say, man, we I, I'm going to want to stretch pretty far when we do do Oliver for Best Picture Showdown. Mm-hmm. I'm not just going to want to watch those five. I'm going to want to watch a, <laughs> a lot of other stuff. That's going to be a big, big time week. Uh Because this is this I, when I'm kind of looking at it from, a you know, a, a big scope here. There's just a lot of stuff going on. You know, I, I, I look down and I see the odd couple, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, I, the subject was roses. I really want to see uh, Isadora. I never really heard much about it. The fixer. I want to see all of these. <laughs> yeah. God that's damn it. Cool. <laughs> that's the cool thing about these, you know, older ceremonies is there's so much untapped, at least by us that like we go in there, you know, and we, managed to mine a whole bunch of new films that we want to add to our catalog. It's it's fun. <laughs> yeah, and, and what what's uh interesting about it is uh you know of course we 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 get to watch them and talk about them on this show. But the cooler part about it is what you were just kind of saying is that it's simply new movies that we haven't heard of to watch. Yeah, that's that's really all I need. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, Faces was a movie that I had kind of heard of, but once we did the show, it was like, oh man, okay, I can kind of finally, you know, finally go for that one and have a reason to talk about it. Hell yeah, you know, that's that's uh, I, I feel grateful for that. <laughs> as do I, as do I. Um, best original screenplay. Here we go. We've got Hot Millions by Ira Wallach and Peter Ustinov. Faces by John Cassavetes. The Battle of Algiers by Franco Salinas and Gilo Pontecorvo. 2001 A Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke. And the winner, and I can't believe I'm saying this, The Producers by Mel Brooks. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. You're, 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 that's, that's one of your guys, yeah? Oh, Mel Brooks is one of my guys. <laughs> and The Producers is a blast. That is a funny, funny movie. And I love that a comedy movie took screenplay from these films. That is just fantastic. Yeah, we've, we've uh, you know, as we've looked, we've seen, you know, comedies, if they are going to do any damage at the Oscars, screenplay is the place that they go. It's, yeah. it's, the, place, it's the place for them to, you know, kind of live and possibly get a win. And I, I love that. I, I love that, you know, Mel Brooks is, you know, a, a huge, huge name and I always want to bring up where does producers rank amongst his stuff for you? Oof. Um, it's pretty high tier. Cause you have some, you have some personal favorites there, you know, some kind of high tier stuff. Nothing's taking the top spot away from young Frankenstein. Yeah. I figured 1974 classic. Yeah. Then it's probably space balls. Then probably blazing saddles. Then the producers, then Robin hood men in tights. Uh, not a fan of Dracula Dead and loving it. I think that's a terrible movie. 
Um, I haven't seen High Anxiety or Life Stinks. History of the World Part One is not bad. It's kind of forgettable. Uh, and then I still have to see, you know, Silent Movie, To Be or Not To Be, The Twelve Chairs. I've got, a, I've still got some work to do. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as 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 we all do with mo- most most filmmakers, right? And as we both do with some Cassavetes. But do, do you uh, do do you like uh, the screenplay here for Faces? Does it deserve this kind of this kind of nomination? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but no, it, I think it, this movie is incoherent, cinematically incoherent, and I do not think it deserves to be here. Oh man, yeah. Uh, uh, of course, you know this is this is where uh, we we disagree. I think um, I think there's so so much happening, you know, with with the, what people are talking about. Some of it, some of it high concept, some of it really low concept, some of it kind of drunken. Most of it assholery. Most of it, <laughs> most of it, just kind of you know shit people. Ha- having having a night you know and i don't know what it is man and i uh, i'm still searching for it but i i just uh i like movies like that i like movies that just really hone in on something whether it be good or bad and like force you to just kind of sit there and, and deal with it for a little bit you know it, it reminded me of a lot of movies that i that i really like uh even you know even something like uh kids or days to confused or stuff that just goes bam you know kind of hits you in one day and just kind of rocks you you know and just kind of like moments um moments of something it it definitely reminded me of malcolm and marie (laughs) (laughs) uh the most one of the more recent movies over on netflix uh seems to have a heavy influence on a lot of stuff that i that i've seen and watched and have a taste for, have a like for, or an opinion on. And I, I certainly swung in the way, in the, in the, in the, in the liking way of uh, faces. I just, I just kind of f- fell for it right away. Like I, like I told you, I, yeah. <laughs> I like watching drunk people yell at each other. <laughs> well, if we're talking like 1968 original screenplays, then I've got uh-huh. two films that deserve to be here. And that's Night of the Living Dead. And once upon a time in the West. Oh yeah, oh, once upon a time in the West. I can't argue with there. That 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 maybe should have won the whole damn thing. It yeah, I think you know two films that are, you know, rightly classics that got shut out, and I think last you know way past I think everything here almost. So you know, I, I, looking back, I think of you know, what where does where do these films rank in terms of legacy, and there's not a lot here that has stood the test of time. Uh, Planet of the Apes and the producers, and I guess in some circles, 2001 A Space Odyssey, they've all kind of stayed here. (laughs) But the rest of these films never really left the 60s. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, Faces has like a cult crowd. I would say that... I, I would say that there's there's still people who are like really into stuff like funny girl in line in winter, you know, but, yeah. it's, but it's, but it's small, but it's small. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's like a cult. Yeah, it's like a cult thing. Yeah. And Kubrick just has this, you know, this huge weight behind just his name. When you hear Stanley Kubrick, it, it immediately has so much to it. He's got an adjective now, you know, Kubrickian is a word. <laughs> Kubrickian, yeah. But I just think it would be really cool if, you know, a breakout zombie movie or a spaghetti western, you know, took a spot from one of these movies. I thought that I think that would have been really cool and would have legitimized these films in critics' eyes early on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. I I think the Oscars just completely miss most of the time and then sometimes they they do some cool stuff and in the case of this show, I think they mostly missed, <laughs> uh, and they, they got they got something down with Rosemary's Baby, Ruth Gordon. That's really cool. Uh, if you scroll down, uh, best short subject cartoons, Winnie and Winnie, <laughs> Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> that's cute. That, that's that's good to see, right? You know, Winnie the Pooh is uh, very important in my childhood. Uh, <laughs> how about how about Bullet? Have you seen that one? 
I have not. Steve McQueen, I really haven't uh, dug into. The original Steve McQueen. I haven't yeah. really <laughs> dug into yeah. his work beyond like The Great Escape and uh, The Magnificent Seven and The Towering Inferno. Yeah. Yeah. Same, man. I have a lot of work to do. I want to see that one. I want to see Wild in the Streets. The Sand Pebbles. Uh, a couple of films that were up for, for best film editing. Uh, you got War and Peace. <laughs> that one best foreign language film. That's a that's a heavy one that I'll, I'll eventually watch because I'm trying to watch all of the best foreign language winners over over time. Uh, it's yeah, man, you, you when you dig into these 60s years, you there's a lot going on. Holy shit. 431 minutes. Are you kidding me? Yeah, man. Yeah. Why? Why would you do that to yourself? Because I want to. I want to see it, man. I want to see what it's, I want to see if it's uh, worth all that worth all that time i can tell you right now no movie on earth is worth that kind of time well here's the thing with that one though it, it's broken up into four parts the first one's in uh, 147 the second one's 100 the, the third one's 84 and the fourth one is 100 so people watch mini series and things like that all the time i don't see why i couldn't split that up into four different nights Okay. Hey, it's your time. If you want to give, you know, hell yeah, I want to. I, I want to watch all of the best foreign language winners, and that's one of them. Two I don't and a half. Skip. Two and a half days of a Russian epic. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't that sound fantastic? It yeah. says right next. It says USSR right next to it as the winner. Like I want to know. I want to know what's going on. I want to. You got it, it. Beat it. It beat a Hungarian movie, Czechoslovakian movie, an Italian movie. And a French movie. Yeah. I want I to see all five of those. I think it's crazy that a, a Soviet, not a Russian film, a Soviet film, won best foreign film in the middle of the Cold War. Yeah. I want to see it. It's called That's War kind of and Peace. <laughs> I got to know what's going on within war. I mean, I've heard people talk about this isn't fucking news or anything. You know, I, I've, I've, I've heard people give their opinion on it and say that it is worth the time, you know, and I've also heard that it's, yeah, it's, it's, long as shit and buckle up uh I, yeah I, i'm down though you know i'm down to I'm down to go through that trek i don't know if i am i don't know if i can join you on that one i'll do it on my own time don't worry <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man silly stuff <laughs> crazy um i think it's neat that ice station zebra is in here i know that movie is the i just yeah. saw that, yeah. The yeah. one that Howard Hughes watched on repeat for like a year. <laughs> Just crazy. I've never seen that's it. That's someone who uh, has not really been brought up on this show. That will, uh, obviously, one day is, uh, is Howard. Howard Hughes, yeah. Not known particularly for his films, but did make some, some bangers, apparently. Yeah, that's what I hear. <laughs> <laughs> the original billionaire. <laughs> Very Mr. Howard. Yeah, yeah, I think 40, 41st Academy Awards, we we have uh, an opinion on, on some stuff, but mostly we, we want to dive in, and uh, we also wish that there was some stuff that we personally like represented more. Uh, you, you mentioned Night of the Living Dead. I mean, yeah, where the hell? What's going on? <laughs> Once Upon a Time in the West, come on. Movie that, movies that have just kind of stood the test of time, and you hate to see that. That kind of always rings, you know, uh, raises the question of if the Oscars happened, you know, three or three or four or five years afterwards, would they look totally different after movies get time to breathe? And you, you would think that with this year specifically, that it would look totally different. Nobody deserves best supporting actor more than Henry Fonda as Frank the Bastard. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. What a great call. Don't you love seeing Uncle Ben win best actor for Charlie? How about that? <laughs> Charlie has been on my list for a long time. I would really like to see that movie. I'm familiar with the story Flowers for Algernon. I've seen the uh, the 90s uh, TV movie they did with Matthew Modine. Very sad story. And uh, yeah, I'd like to see that. Uh, Hell yeah. I, I mean, yeah. Cliff Robertson obviously plays Uncle Ben in the uh, Sam Raimi Spider-Man, you know. And and the psycho president escaped from L.A. Yeah, he he he's he's pretty fantastic, and anytime anytime you can watch him, it's good. You know, he he beat Alan Arkin, Alan Bates, Ron Moody, and eight time nominated zero wins. Peter O'Toole, <laughs> ah, Peter O'Toole, God, 
And this is his second time playing King Henry II after Beckett. So you can kind of see The Lion in Winter as almost a pseudo sequel in a way. There you go. Yeah. And, and, and Peter O'Toole, one, one of the only guys, because I believe he was nominated for that, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he's one of the only guys that's been nominated to play the same character. Yeah. Yeah, has not happened a lot. You know, Bing Crosby, Al Pacino, uh, Sylvester Stallone, weirdly. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> Just don't, you know, you don't, you don't think Oscar, you don't think three-time Oscar nominee when you think Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> No offense. No, no, you don't. But you do think Rocky and Rocky breeds Oscars. So yes, indeed. Oh, <laughs> we did that. That was a uh, what episode three, I believe, nineteen seventy six. Uh, got to talk about Rocky. That was great. That was uh, great. It, it is. It is wonderful to to look at these guys as the perspective of Oscar nominated or Oscar winning. Um, with Peter O'Toole, like we said, has has the eight. Uh, nomination zero wins but alan arkin's always a name that i love to see you know yeah we've we've talked a bit about him on this show uh from 2006 little miss sunshine you know all all the way till now you know 1968 it's pretty cool you know it's pretty cool when a guy can kind of live uh inside of a show like this because he's nominated uh uh, 30 years apart Yeah, these guys keep coming back. You know, they've been giving quality performances for decades, and these are people who, you know, are going to come back on this show randomly when we just, you know, stumble upon their work again. It's great. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, uh, you got anything else to say about 1968 before we go into our awards? You got anything? No, I think we covered pretty much everything we uh, wanted to say. Yeah, we got the, uh, you know, 41st Academy Awards. Got some stuff that we both definitely want to see and have our opinions on on what's there and what isn't. you know, uh, we're going to get into these awards and I'm really excited, but uh, after that, uh, you know, <clears throat> there's no, it's no secret that next week is going to be a best picture showdown. So I, I want to explain um, how we're going to kind of change that up a little bit after we do the awards. Uh, if you can remind me. <laughs> yeah, I'll do my best. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, you know, this is your uh, first time with us. Thank you. Um, if you've been here before, you know, you know, the drill, we have the Tarantino for best quote or best line. We have the Ennio Morricone for best music moment, needle drop, soundtrack, bit, whatever it may be. Uh, the Philip Seymour Hoffman Award for best performance, who won the movie. And then the Roger Deakins for best moment, best scene, um, and what have you. Uh, it's gonna be, let's have some fun here. I know you uh, didn't love this movie, uh, <laughs> but what's your Tarantino? This was very difficult because I was, I zoned out a few times, but I found my way back. Um, my... Tarantino comes from Mr. Jim McCarthy. Uh, nice. Asshole nice. client that Jeannie is with when uh, Dickie goes to see her. He's talking about his, like, his kid who wears sneakers. And he's so upset about that. And he says, so what have I got after all these years? A big house, a kooky wife, and a kid who wears sneakers. I, just, I thought that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's telling. It's very telling. <laughs> yeah, like that's what you're complaining about as you're, you know, hanging out with a hooker. That's you're, yeah, you're yeah. in a bad spot. <laughs> yeah, reminds you of just kind of yeah, sh- shitty, shitty characters in movies. Uh, <laughs> I, I love a, that. I was such a prick. Like, oh my god. <laughs> uh, you know, you know who gave a really interesting performance was uh, uh, Fred Draper uh, as Freddie Draper towards the beginning of the movie and. I I wondered if uh, Don Draper was maybe named after him for Mad Men a little bit. I don't know, (laughs) but uh, he, he he was, he was fascinating, just drunk as hell, you know, and saying all kinds of nonsense. (laughs) There's that him. And uh, I I love that you brought up uh, your, your Tarantino. Who who was it? Uh, Not Val Avery. Yeah. Yeah. Jim McCarthy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Val Val Avery. Avery, I I love, I, I, I love those performances as well. Yeah. Good stuff. I had, uh, Prior to that, I did have one written down that was a Fred Draper line. Uh, I don't remember what it was, but it had something to do with, uh, like, it was like, you're old and gray and I'm fat and gray or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember what you're talking about. Yeah. Calling people fat. Yeah. <laughs> it happens a lot. This movie. Um, uh, yeah. It's disgusting. <laughs> These people. <laughs> my, my Tarantino comes from a, it comes from Seymour Castle uh, as, as Chet. It's when 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 he's just kind of 
sitting there having a chat with <clears throat> with uh, Maria Forst, uh, Lynn Carlin's character. And he says, nobody has the time to be vulnerable to each other. Mm. It's kind of one of the famous lines from the movie and something that just stuck out to me, you know, in a, in a very kind of clean cut, easy way. Like I just kind of picked it out and then I was reading about it and I was like, oh, this, this seems like it's kind of one of the taglines of the movie and totally makes sense. Uh, the, the delivery from Seymour Castle, this guy who's just like, I'm just fucking lost and no idea what's going on, but I love, love him because he's just dancing and grooving and having a good, having a good time. <laughs> uh, and, and, and he sits down and every now and again, you hear these people say these kind of heavy things yeah. without really, without really figuring it out or, you know, can totally confronting it. They're just kind of saying these things lazily and sloppily and, and just moving on and, and then kind of a drunken sloppy manner and Seymour Castle totally got it. Well, I like that line because this film really is about relationships and how we view them and how, you know, what we put, what we take stock in, in our lives and how yeah. most relationships are pretty surface level. And you know, like, like you said, we don't have time to be vulnerable. So once relationships we forge that last, we have to take care of them. And you know, otherwise they're going to blow up like they did in this film. Yeah. Insightful. I like it. Hell yeah, man. What's your, uh, what's your Ennio Morricone? Very interesting music going on in this movie. Yeah, this was, uh, this was tough, but a scene came along that I couldn't ignore because it was so bad. And it's the scene where Dickie goes to the nightclub and those God awful lounge singers are singing about like singing this song about love. And they are so tone deaf that it was all I could pay attention to. And so I went with that because I was laughing my ass off at how horrible these, this couple was at like open mic night at the nightclub or whatever the hell that was because they were yes. god awful. <laughs> That's awesome. The Ennio Morricone. Yeah. Uh, the year that Once Upon a Time in the West comes out. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Not fair. Not fair. I love that. I love that so much. That's awesome. I was wondering where you were going to go with it because because you you didn't like the movie, so I love that you took it in that route. <laughs> it's fantastic. I I liked I liked the uh, the song when Chet you see him first dancing. Uh, so this would be you know when uh, Maria Forrest is just kind of like, all right, I guess this fucker's left me um, for this other woman. And I guess I'll move on. I'm going to go out dancing and go out and, you know, have a good time. And this is, this is when the camera work gets really, you know, really, really fascinating and super, super kind of, you know, gravitating for me. Just I, I couldn't look away. There was nothing else I wanted to do, but just kind of smile at uh, just what I was watching. And there's a song called Skatling <laughs> playing, <laughs> uh, you know, it's just kind of, loud as hell you know you can barely hear anything else that's going on you can just well lots of lots of editing lots of hard cuts and different things going on with the camera and seymour castle is kind of at the forefront of that scene and he's just dancing away you know flipping his hair up and just kind of going wild and and then lynn carlin uh maria forrest sees him and the scene just kind of you know kind of goes in its own direction and then um the movie the movie takes a whole another direction after that because now Chet is very much in play. So uh, I love that his name's Chet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. And Se- Seymour Castle, a guy who's become, uh, you know, he, he was like a Wes Anderson staple and that's, that's when I fell in love with him. And now I have a whole nother way to look at his career. And I, I, I feel like Wes Anderson probably watched this movie and was like, I'm going to use that guy, <laughs> you know, and kind of, kind of rejuvenate their whole career. I, I like when directors do that and uh, Seymour is a guy I, I want to watch more of. Fair enough. Very nice. Yeah. I can, this is a film that especially, you know, Cassavetes has influenced a lot of different guys. I know that uh, I was reading in the trivia. This is Steve Buscemi's favorite movie, which is odd, but I'll take it. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so yeah. These guys, you know, in the sixties and seventies, these were kind of the, you know, at the forefront of a new generation of filmmakers. So, no surprise that you know, guys came up in the 90s would 
idolize these guys. Yeah, for sure, man. For mm-hmm. sure. Right on. The PSH. This was, uh, well, <laughs> I kind of had to just uh, go with my gut here, and I went with Jenna Rollins as Jeannie. Same, uh, same. I think she's, yeah, I think she's one of the best performers I've ever fucking seen. Yeah. <laughs> well, since I watched A Woman Under the Influence, like, right before this, I got to see a pretty wide range from her. And uh, I was impressed by her kind of rest- um, her restrained subtlety in this film and how she's like, she wants to blow up, but she can't or she'll risk losing business. And she's just, you know, when she does blow up, she has like very justifiable moments where she stands up for herself. And I thought that was, that was good. Yeah. She's, she's freaky good. Jenna. I I love this lady. Which performance do you like better? Woman under the influence for sure. I think that that her performance kind of scared me in that. When she's, yeah, when, when she's, uh, there's a scene when she's talking with, when, you know, she's talking with Peter Falk with her husband and she's doing this thing with her thumb, like, and then with her, with her mouth. And it's just like, it's fucking crazy. It's me, uh, it's, awesome, awesome performance. I, I, I kind of wish she would have won. <laughs> for me, it's when she's talking to the doctor and she just starts going, she goes like that. She's like, back, back, yeah. Empire, back. Oh man. Like she's off her fucking rocker. Christ, you know, the, you know what's really cool about about Cassavetes and about Jenna specifically, them too, is um, with Gloria and A Woman Under the Influence. Both of those were movies that you know were ones I had kind of heard of, but there's always a push that you need, right? You know, whether it be you know for the show or whatever, but for personal reasons, you know, you you just kind of need a push sometimes. And both those movies, it was through Criterion Channel and it was through uh, this section called Adventures in Movie Going. And the, the uh, Safdie brothers, Josh and Benny, they were like, Gloria is one of the coolest, you know, New York City movies. And, you know, that's where they're from. And you can totally see some of Cassavetes and Uncut Gems, like totally. It's fucking crazy. And... I love that. I love when that happens. And then for a woman on the influence, Bill Hader was the one who was like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> this his voice. He he talked on and on about about Jenna, Jenna Rowland's performance, you know, and how it's just kind of suffocating and just kind of blows you away and how the movie just keeps going and just keeps going. <laughs> and, and you kind of either just kind of fall for it or you're just kind of like kind of scared by it. Yeah, and I I really appreciate when when people that I already like say that stuff, and it's like, well, I, I want to fucking watch it, see what they see in it, you know, and then you kind of take it in your own other way, you know, and with with a woman under the influence, I, I I was I was pretty convinced that I had seen one of the best like lead performances I, I I've seen in, in in like a couple of years. Wow, yeah, I feel bad for not really enjoying Cassavetes that much because he clearly means a lot to you. He, he, he does. And he's, he's building, he's, he's, he's building on me, but, but, but Jenna is the one who's kind of, wait a minute. I've found by diving into Cassavetes by default, you, you, you dive into Jenna Rowlands, you know, and now, now I have this whole other new kind of amazing respect for her. And okay. there was no doubt in my mind that the PSH was going to go to her, you know, she's, she's hard to not watch when she's on the screen. She has that, that gift. If there's four people on the screen and she's one of them, she's probably the one you're going to gravitate towards. Uh, I feel the same way about her as I do like Amy Adams right now. If Amy Adams is on the screen with four other like superstars, I'm still probably going to watch her. I I don't know what it is, but she's just that damn good, you know? And and Jen, Jen, Jenna has that same, same gift. I don't know if I'd go that far yet, but no, you've seen more than I have with her, so I'll I'll trust your your judgment on that. Hey, always you always keep going though. You always keep going to see if you can find more, or if sometimes it can uh, deteriorate your opinion. Sometimes it can reinforce it. You just never know. Yeah, the journey is ongoing. Yeah, for sure. And and yeah, Jen, Jenna and Cassavetti, so I'm on board. Yeah. <laughs> well done. All right. Um, the Roger Deacons. Uh, 
I, <laughs> I, just, I don't, I don't have a lot of, you know, insight and like, you know, heavy thoughts here. It's more just like, Oh, okay. With that one. So it's a scene that for me, it's a scene that was built up for quite a bit when Dickie shows up at Jeannie's apartment and Jim and his friend get very territorial and Jim instigates a fight and yeah. Jim and Dickie start fighting but they start fighting like children and they're just like, you know, grabbing each other and like, t- like jostling. I was not expecting a jostle. <laughs> so no, I was, no, yeah, I was expecting a fight like two grown men would have, but I got a jostle and it made me chuckle and it stuck with me. So I, I picked that. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. It's definitely a, a, a little bit out of left field, you know, and yeah. you, you always love when a, a movie that's taking itself really seriously just does that out of nowhere. Cause it's like, Oh, they kind of get it. <laughs> and then, you know, it, it's like, you know, an uncut gems when Adam Sandler's in the closet and he's like fake, you know, he's sexting his girlfriend from in there and she just starts playing with herself. It's out of nowhere, but you're like, Oh, this is happening now. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so <laughs> a lot, a lot of things just flooded into my mind of like, huh? Why is this in the movie? But all right, <laughs> yeah. And then they like they stop fighting and they're like, hey, no hard feelings, right? And they're like, let's, let's trade business cards. We'll do business. <laughs> like, what happened? <laughs> I love that. I lo- that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you saw that. Uh, the, the deacons here, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I've been a little bit typical, but I'm, I'm going to continue to go that way. Uh, I, I, I found the final scene and the, uh, the shot of the staircase, both of them kind of just fucking swimming in their own like disdain and they're just super uncomfortable. He starts smoking a cigarette and like takes his jacket off and she gets up and then he gets up, you know, it's, it just gives you kind of this unsettled feeling as the credits start rolling. And for whatever reason, I like that. (laughs) Uh, And I, there's nothing really resolved here. It's just uh, snippets of life. And I like that the movie is just super, super fast paced with the camera. And then the final shot is, is very calm, peaceful, yeah. But what's happening? But what's happening is not at all. And uh, again, these things I'm pointing out are just not news at all. But I, I was kind of a sucker for those on the nose um, cinematic things, you know? Yeah, and I just it doesn't resonate with me. I, I think yeah. I, just, I think I don't like films about everyday life. That might be what it is. I I view movies very much it's, as escapism. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've definitely figured some stuff out about like. You're not a big hangout movie person. Not really. It, no. it it really it really needs to have strong strong like sub you know subplots like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where you got really strong things happening throughout, where it kind of just just bites, just kind of bites at you. Well, and there's and, also and it's yeah that, yeah that one's also got like mega star power. Well, there's certain directors like you know Tarantino and to an extent, you know, David Lynch that I can kind of <clears throat> shut myself off from and say like, all right, this is a Tarantino movie. This is a Lynch movie. I kind of know what to expect. I don't have the usual roadblocks up so I can just kind of go in. But yeah, when it's, when it's uncharted territory and I stumble into something like this and I'm just like, Oh, this is what we're doing. I'm, I'm, I'm not in. I, I like to have, I like to think this is something I would never see or be a part of. Let's do it. I I've been around old people yelling at each other. It's not that fun to me. <laughs> so I just don't yeah. I don't care. There's no reason for me to care. And I don't know. That's it's, it really just comes up to personal personal hangups for me, man. I've I've uh I've come to terms. But with I, but I've also I've also seen you, you know, I've seen you and heard you talk about movies that are um you know, about about whatever normal life, you know. You recently watched My Fair... Well, not recently. Uh, not too, too long ago. You watched uh, My Fair Movie from 2019, Waves. True. 
and waves waves really is like a movie that really hones in on a family and True. i you know I, I i wonder what it is about that one i mean it, it's so beautifully you know beautifully shot i've wondered about that one aside from sterling k brown being amazing <laughs> what is it what is it that 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 kind of sticks with you well because that movie to me is not a situation that I personally would ever find myself in. You know, I wouldn't accidentally, mm-hmm. spoiler alert, kill the, the woman carrying my child. So yeah. like, that kind of thing, I don't know. I'm, I'm really just shooting in the dark here about why I find certain movies. No, no, no. I think it's, I think it's context. Yeah, context is big. Performance is big. And that movie does have a story, Waves. It has a story about a family, you know, struggling and trying to find their way back from a horrific tragedy. Yeah. And yeah, I think that that was better. You know, it's not. And also, I think I, I put this in my review. If I didn't, I meant to. I'm tired of these kinds of stories of, you know, rich, angry white people with their own problems that I don't give a shit about. Yeah, totally get it. Totally get it. Yeah. I don't I, I don't I don't um personally know of many movies that I there's a lot of movies that I see that are influenced by faces but I don't know of many that quite quite have the same um, the same skill going on within it I, like I, I, with, with old people just arguing um, because typically I'm trying to rack my brain like typically if you're watching a movie of just a bunch of old people kind of just kind of bantering or whatever it is n- just not going to be shot this way. It's not going to look this way. It's not going to be edited this way. And I think that's why I, like so many other people, just kind of kind of got suckered in by it. was like, whoa. Yeah. Typically, typically, I'm watching old movies and they're, you know, they're just shot in a very specific way, kind of, you know, kind of like, you know, with this very wide scope, you know. This was, this was so different seeing... You know, seeing John Marley, like seeing every little wrinkle on his face, like it it was uncomfortable, but it was interesting. Well, and they know there it is again. That's you really paying attention to the way the film is constructed, whereas I hone in on the way the film is written. And yeah, I think that's just, you know, that that's the fundamental difference between the way we both view film. Fascinating. I love it. I, I personally give give faces a uh, a nine. I love love Cassavetes. <laughs> uh, it's a huge difference here between Connor and I on rating. Uh, I, I'm I'm wicked excited to keep seeing his stuff. The one I want to see most next is um, is a uh, Husbands from 1970. Uh, that one's like two and a half hours. <laughs> uh, I'll definitely be checking that one out sometime soon. Um, and then, and then usually I'll just take what I can get from, uh, from Criterion because his stuff pops up on there every now and again uh, and Faces is uh, Criterion selected. So it's always going to be there for me. Good for you. Bear, yep. You enjoy that. I, I, I give it a five. I was not a fan. I, I didn't care. And I, that's me. Just, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough man fair enough I, lo- I love the honesty i love uh i love this is the uh <clears throat> by far the biggest difference we've had in the in the whole show of oscar sunday yeah yeah i, I we'll have more for sure i wonder when we're gonna have a movie that i adored and you hated because that hasn't happened yet we'll see that that i just I, I think that's gonna be hard for for it to happen i think it's always going to be a movie like this where you have like a pretty pretty egotistical creator making a movie and it's just kind of just going to be divisive by nature because of its because of its uh, distinct style and just like David Lynch you know when we were talking about him it was just kind of like most of it you're like what the hell this is this is kind of mindless and pointless <clears throat> while there are a couple gems. And I do think there will be a couple gems there for, for Cassavetes for you. Uh, I, I really do. I, I believe that. I believe that he has enough in his uh, filmography for you to enjoy something. I, I just watched this week. I watched shadows, his, his debut. And that one falls more in line with something like faces. So I would stay away from that one for you, but uh, 
I, I'm sticking with my guns on Gloria. That's the one I think you should, if you ever uh, have time, I think Gloria from 1980 is one that you, I, I think you, you'll enjoy a bit more. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> keep that in the, the back burner. Or, or uh, maybe we can just bring it up on uh, the show sometime when we do 1980. I don't know. <laughs> That's how I'm going to have to, you know, a lot of these films, I'm just going to have to end up talking about them on the show. I don't want to yeah. say entrapment. But that's pretty much how I'm expecting to see a lot of these films going forward is they end up on the schedule and here we are. And I'm okay Man. with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and you also uh, know that we have movies, especially like in the near future, that we're going to be doing that are like amazing and personal favorites. You know, movies that you and I want to watch with this kind of lens so we can give awards to it and figure out what our favorite things are about it. So that's one of our very favorite things to do. Doing that with Fargo last week was such a treat. And then being able to do this, dive into a new movie and, and disagree uh, politely, I'll say. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and have a, have a fun episode either way. That, that's what I love about this show. And uh, n- next week's going to be going to be fascinating, man. Um, Cause it's, it's best picture showdown time for episode 40. Yes. But and, yeah, before, before, yeah, before we uh, get into those changes, I think we have one more thing. Yeah. What are we? Oh, well, the changes was what I was going to get into. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> that, that's yeah. That's yeah. Of course you got to get to that. Um, with the best picture showdown, we, if there's any confusion with any listeners, you know, uh, we've done a, a hand, a, uh, more than a handful of best picture winners now on the show. Uh, but un- under this 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 new kind of formula that we're doing with the best picture showdowns, every fifth episode, uh, you know, Kramer versus Kramer, we did it proper for episode twenty five. We did the apartment for episode thirty, and we did Moonlight for episode thirty five. And we really honed in on that ceremony and that best picture group, and got to watch all of them, talk about them figure out which ones we you know thinks you know which one we should have won that kind of thing <clears throat> but i want to take a little bit further so next week we're doing 1981 chariots of fire ah. now this is a movie that uh we both are going to watch you know sometime within the week but we've also been doing some legwork on our own to watch the other four movies yes which are indiana jones <laughs> fucking raiders uh Reds, Atlantic City, and on Golden the other Pond. One? And on Golden Pond. So those are the five that we're gonna be that we're gonna be discussing heavily uh on uh next week uh, for episode 40. We're, we're going to give our awards out to Chariots of Fire because that's the winner. That's the best picture winner from, from 1981. We're, we're gonna definitely do that. But what I want to do with those those five, Connor, is from here on out, for the best picture showdowns, I want both of us to come up with a ranking of all the best picture nominees. So you you pick whichever one you think is the best, and second, third, fourth, fifth, and I'll do the same thing. Uh, that way, when we come into episode 40, we'll both be ready to kind of figure out where we both see both of them ranking, and we can, we can have more of a discussion on what we think is last place, first place, this and that. Uh, we feel like it's a it's a great year to kind of start start doing that with because 1981, right away, you know, Raiders is both of us are just <laughs> huge huge fans. You know, it's a obviously a massive 80s movie and it's going to be a lot of fun to talk about 1981. I can't wait. Yeah, and this will be a new way to kind of beef up the conversation a little, make it a little bit more special than our uh, standard episodes. Yeah, correct, correct. We want those uh, every fifth to be worth all the legwork we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. throughout the month of watching all these movies um super excited and of course uh you know we're going to be the train's going to keep rolling through uh through through february into uh into march and we got you know golden globes coming up and oscars coming up in april and just all kinds of crazy stuff happening so this show will uh you know keep moving through everything absolutely absolutely um on Filmgasm this Wednesday, we have a very special episode. We have our two-year anniversary uh, extravaganza where we're going to count down the 20 scariest movie moments we've gone through on that podcast. Very excited for that. And then, of course, on uh, 
sneak preview tomorrow. We'll be covering a few films, Minari, Tom and Jerry, you know, maybe some other ones. Uh, come and see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what's up. Hell yeah. And don't miss the debut of Guys Who Giggle with the Giggle Guys on March 5th. Very excited. Oh, yeah. Cannot wait for that, uh, for Joan and Andrew's show to come to life. And we've been waiting a long time for this, and we, we can't wait. It's going to be going to be really cool. And comedy deserves a place to be, a place to live. And, and that's, 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 where, that's where it's going to find a home with Juwan and Andrew on Giggle Guys. Absolutely. Can't wait. Thank you for listening with us. And uh, keep watching movies. Mm-hmm.